Yo, 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 freaking yo. So check this out. This is a Go Deep episode. This is not like most of the Go Deep episodes because we just got a lot of shit going on. So we're going to keep, like this week, we're going to do our shit kind of short and sweet. Well, not really. People have been telling me they like for me to make videos like this more often. I don't know why, but I found something where I could do. I can incorporate both. Sometimes I would still do my long podcast, like two hours, three hours, one and a half hours, whatever. But I noticed my short little videos are getting a lot, a lot, a lot of views. And not just that, they're getting a lot, a lot, a lot of fucking comments. So, watch how I flip this. But before we flip this, you gotta go listen to some music. That's how we do. Be right back. Yeah. The cookout, yeah. Everybody's Check invited. It out. Only the righteous this is shit. What it's about, kid. God the great, the future, but righteousness. The scenes and uplift. Yo, Check it. Hold up, kid. For real, it's a family day. Celebrate yo, this shit. Yo. It's the big day, rally with the guards, cars parked up in the driveway, in the trenches with the suspenses, gotta make a few stops, get some trees from the pit stop, Bill with the Gauri, he's on the block, we did our bit together in the sixth building, smoke trees at wreck time to keep our minds filled in, smoke to kill us in, on the bad phone, want me to scoop him right quick before we zone, hit downtown Medina, my spot's blown, kill an army in your galaxy, the guards is known, for war pawns to shatter and bone, and star domes zone off blow your clone off and take the crowd home to the cookout digital phone book out on the lookout for the girl scout with a cookie out snatch killer up i-95 he knew the route doing about a buck in the war truck the guard rolling up as usual new lp shaking the rear views arriving shortly approaching the gate smelling the guard degree to see my fam together as one it makes me happy events like this keep my family tight despite the mics great minds think alike we a your light, be your light, so we can see your light. Gather the seeds, recite from the book of life. The book of life feels like this. Keep my family tight, despite the mics. Great minds think alike. We a your light, be your light, so we can see your light. Gather the seeds, recite from the book of life. The book of life, and hey, yo, to be exact, it's the guard day of the month. Nice and hot. Fat asses out on the block, that's what we peeped out Coming through with some fat shit, smoked out On our way to the big day, where the whole family's at From the grandmas down to the stars Parlaying and having a fantastic time Hanging out, cooking out, smoking out of my dome piece With the guards niece, that I knew back from knowledge Coach to knowledge, apartment 3G Sitting back with me, analyzing the sunshine over the family And the scenes going up tremendously fast Right before your eyes, next yeah. thing you know they All my size. life I waited for this, a day of pure bliss Celebrated with a kiss, twist the back and reminisce Way back to the pro days, rockin' pro cage That was okay, but not good enough for missing 4K Damn, I used to love her like common Not enough to understand the common bond between woman and the man When I humped her, I guess cause I was younger back then Plus the fact I wasn't packing, no meat, a little fat kid Hungry for some action daily, so a Play laser tag with real gas, suicide, perhaps a skelly by the black vents and tents. My mind flash and dip the 9-6. Yo, I'm on now. Soldiers of the dark underground hit. Plus on the shit, regardless. I made it that way. Growing from the dirt like a garden. Starving no more. This kid is famished. Awaiting for the day that we established for the festivals of guards and the planets. We plan it, understand it. God damn it feels good to have a natural meal that's untampered with. Then they in the wheelchair. Chair lamping, pop a trash about Chef Pan sagging off a stash. Little children running wild in the grass. Single foul, form a line for this fool. Settle down for there's a jewel in the stash. Yo, it feels like this. Keep my family tight. Despite the mics, great my stick of light. Be a your light, be a light, so we can see a light. Gather the seeds, recite from the book of life. The book of life, it feels like this. Keep my family tight. Despite the mics, great my stick of light. Be a your light. Be a light so we can see a light Gather the seeds, recite from the book of life The book of life, yeah, world up
<laughs> so I hope you like that song. <laughs> Don't know what song it is because I haven't edited it in yet. But let's just talk about, so lately this week, um, no, not lately this week. So far this week, we've been busting fucking ass, y'all. We've been killing it. What we did the other day when we got like 80, I think it was like 81 or 83,000 tweets. That was amazing. We, uh, I'm sure we showed WB a lot that we needed to show. I'm sure we did. I'm sure we did our job. And that's amazing that everybody's coming together and kind of doing that. Mmm. Oh, fuck. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you see, I got a lighter in my hand. I'm not smoking. I lit my candle. It's a, it is a candle. You see? Light. But, so, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Today, I got an interview with, um... My homeboy, Ohio Dave. It's a short and sweet interview because we both had to tend to our youngins. <laughs> um, so we're going to get into that in a few minutes. But before we get into that, I still want to talk. I want to let everybody know y'all doing a great job. We need to keep it up. Um, just keep pumping on Twitter. Let's see. We need to get some of these Facebook people involved on Twitter. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of Facebook you know, like Snyder Rooms and shit like that. And we need to get y'all to have a Twitter account because if we get y'all on Twitter with what we're doing, we can easily get 100,000 tweets. Um, yesterday I made a video about the, uh, for lack of a better word, the dick riders that's just bouncing back and forth. One hates, you know... One year they hate Zack Snyder, they hate us. The next year they love him. Now, I mean, now they love him because he's popular as fuck. But he's always been popular. I made a video about that last night to kind of, I don't know, just kind of say my piece. But, you know, a lot of, what I, I kind of want to reiterate on that a little bit. When we, like, think about this, guys. Y'all now, and I'm talking about the dick riders. That's just jumping on for clout. Right? Y'all now are saying y'all want to see the Snyder Cut and y'all this, that. Y'all would love to see it. But, you know, if y'all wasn't shit talking two years ago or three years ago, we probably would have Zack Snyder still. Do you see that domino effect? And do you see why now a lot of people don't want to fuck with y'all? Because the studio heard all of that shit talking. And that scared them off from fucking with Snyder. Right? So then y'all compounded on that shit talking because y'all thought Marvel was going to be the cool thing forever. While we stayed over here and we dealt with the shit talking, we dealt with the Marvel turds, we dealt with all of that shit, and we never folded, we never switched, we never changed. We had our little squabbles in the crew sometimes, you know, we... But, of course, there's two straight years of a lot of disappointment and frustration. Sometimes shit get, get to each other. But, you guys now that's coming back over, especially like Collider, um, Geeks and Gamers, a few other people, you know. I I saw, um, what's her name? Grace Randolph come over today and she said something positive about Wonder Woman. And she tweeted, I said, thank you. Because... You know, Grace Randolph, that's cool. We're, we're happy you did that. I mean, like I said, it doesn't really matter. If y'all want a promo for the camp, we will take your promo. And we will love it and enjoy it, and we will welcome it. And please continue to promo for us. But, um, you know, like a lot of the people, man, it seemed like, dog, if y'all wasn't fucking around with all that other bullshit like two or three years ago, we wouldn't be in this position right now, you know? So I want y'all to soul search in yourself before the, this movie comes out. Like, I'm not saying it's going to come out. I don't know. But before it comes out, soul search in yourself and ask yourself, yo, am I easily influenced by the crowd or am I a leader in my own right? Because a lot of y'all are easily influenced by the crowd, you know? If... Rotten Tomatoes say something, y'all, oh, shit, blah, 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 blah. You just, 
repeat the narrative like little parrots or whatever the bird that can talk you just repeat the narrative you just repeat 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 and then you want to stick on the narrative because you don't want to be proven wrong so you stick on it for months and months and months maybe even years you just hold on to it because you don't want to be proven wrong but all of that time you're holding on to it all those tweets that you're arguing all of that shit is more negativity in front of us getting a positive outcome so now when we defeat y'all and seemingly has a positive outcome on the horizon now you want to be friends and be back on our side because is i guess it's like well if we can't beat them join them okay whatever i'm not the guy to shoot you anymore but i want you to soul search in yourself and be like damn why did i do that am i a sheep or am i a wolf Am I a sheep or am I a wolf? If you flip sides on us, <clears throat> you're a sheep. You flip sides on us because the narrative from Hollywood and the mo um, mainstream media was to shit on Zach. You did that because you just wanted to be popular in mainstream. All of the people that didn't mind being popular... All of the people that was rooting for the underdog, all of the people that had issues in their life that they wanted to just say, fuck it, I'm going to stand up for something. All of those people, we are the Snyder Cut movement. This is what the corporations are seeing now. This is what America is seeing now. There's a lot of us. We went trending today in one fucking hour. 30 something thousand tweets. There is a lot of us. We're not mainstream. We are not the popular crowd. We are not. I mean. I'm I'm pretty cool. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> no I'm joking. I'm just telling y'all like this. Pick a side. Stay on it. But. When you picked that side, did you really hate Zack Snyder? Did you really hate Zack Snyder's work? Or were you just being a sheep following along to mainstream media? Because now when you come back over, you look like you didn't really hate Zack Snyder. You didn't really hate his work. Now if you're talking about you want to see the Snyder Cut. You didn't really hate. You was lying for two years. That shit look, that shit looks whack. I know I haven't shaved in about a month. <laughs> no, not a month. I haven't shaved in a while. I haven't got a haircut in a while either, but fuck it. It might be no nut November. It might be no shave November too. Who knows? But I just still want to reiterate, when this movie comes out, don't come with your bullshit articles afterwards and try to jump back on the hate Snyder bandwagon. Because we're smarter than that now. We're not we're not dumb like we were in 2016 and 17. We didn't know what was going on with the onslaught of bad press. We know how to fight y'all now. As we see now with Joker, which is probably going to make a billion dollars. The most profitable movie ever. Comic book movie ever. Spent 60 million dollars, made a billion Y'all tried to shit on that too. Mainstream media tried to shit on that too. Now you should see we are stronger than that shit. We are stronger than all of the shit now. Why? Because we had to walk through the crucible. We had to go through these two years of Snyder Cut movement. <laughs> Zach had to teach us. Drop the shirt, raise the level of consciousness. You know? Each time we put out a picture, we gotta take it to the Twitter land and fight with this shit. Now we really know how to fight. So Warner Brothers, if you're listening to us, you got a squad. You have an unbelievable squad. We can go 30,000 deep in one hour. We can mobilize 30,000 tweets in one hour. And Warner Brothers, if you do this shit for us, we will mobilize 100,000 tweets in one hour. If you do a theatrical one, 
run, you will make a billion dollars with the Snyder Cut theatrical run. Especially if it's extended run, especially if you can get it in China, you make over a billion dollars. People talking about HBO Max, HBO Max, everybody. I know y'all are a little price high right now, but I think y'all are price high because you yeah, want to milk it for everything you can. And we will all buy a year subscription. That's just what it is. This is the golden ticket. The Snyder Cut is the golden ticket. Right now, anything Snyder is the golden ticket. Not Endgame. Not fucking Infinity War. Not none of this shit on the horizon. Not no fucking New Gods. None of that shit is just Snyder. It, if it's Snyder, if it's in this comic book industry, it is the golden ticket. We know how to kick the shit out of these fucking haters. We know how to kick the shit out of mainstream media. There's no more blue checks that want to fuck with us anymore. <laughs> They're all scared of us. <laughs> we don't play no fucking games. And we're ready for it. We, we not saying we're ready for our gift. It, 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 it will be a gift. We are ready for that shit. And the road, the path is clear to drop that shit. So, that's about enough talking uh let's get into this interview with dave like i said it's a real quick interview but it's i still wanted to get him on the fucking podcast anyway because i want to keep the morale all week going and that's what i plan to do that's why i've been putting out these little videos with my kids thanks uh chris wong for dropping the video i mean retweeting the video with my kids that was dope um I'm going to just keep putting out content all week, all week. Keep the morale high. We got to keep busting ass. That's what we do. Bust the fucking ass. Warner Brothers, if you're listening, the road is clear. The path is paved. And you have security all along that bitch. The Snyder Spartans. (laughs) We are fucking ready for this fucking movie. So, quickie... The quickie is over. I hope y'all enjoyed it as much as I did. (laughs) Smoke a cigarette. (laughs) All right, let's get into this interview. Ohio Dave, Go Deep Podcast with me, your boy, Mr. West. Where are we at right now? We are in West Ashley, Charleston, South Carolina, the greatest city on the planet. And guess what? Snyder Cut, SC, South Carolina. SC, the name fits. Ya yeah, bitch. Yo, yo, Dave, what's going on, man? Yo, what's <laughs> up, bro? Hey, shit, what's up with you? Not much, man. Oh, Just word. Out, out. Word, word, word. Well, first, let me tell you, I appreciate the interview, man. Everybody been saying, I gotta talk to you for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no problem. I'm glad to, I'm glad to do it, man. All right, all right. Well, um, <clears throat> let me introduce you. We are on Go Deep episode 122. I got my dog, Ohio Dave, in this bitch. <laughs> What's going on, yes, Dave? Sir. Yes, sir. Chill, man. Chill, man. How you been? Everything good, man. Everything good. But first, let me ask you about how the hell are you so good on Fortnite? How did that happen? <laughs> man, I'm not even that good. I'm not even that good. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, right. But I uh, I spend way too much time on it. Uh, so man, I play you it way more than I should. You look like Jesus Christ playing Fortnite, dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my you get god! On there, you play? No, I, we used to play, but my um my little son, he just was doing it too much, man. So I just had to take it off the PlayStation, you know. Dude, I feel you. That fool is a big thing, man. Yeah, that fool get like a little bit good at it, man. That's it's like you get it, it too. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. Trust me. <laughs> so, so uh, I guess the um, biggest question everybody keeps saying. Well, Abdul was like, "Yo, ask him about SnyderCon and tell him, tell him to tell you the story <laughs> about how you got there and all that thing that surrounds that." Dude, it was like, oh my god, it started out good, and then it, and then it got like real good. At the end, yeah. So like we had all, like, like we had all uh, planned on going to SnyderCon, and then Fab 
texted me like like in like a secret text like outside our little group chat right. we got. he was like hey um just between me and you because i know you're not coming in till uh sunday but he's like if you can arrange your flight and you can get here saturday you should do it because like uh, i talked to zach and like he wants to have lunch with us right. on saturday before the watchman party right I was like, are you freaking kidding me? And DB, the other guy in TBZ, he's the one who got my ticket. So I I text DB and I was like, hey, um, I like, I don't want to bother you, but is there any way you can like switch my ticket from Sunday to Saturday so I get in there Saturday around like like Saturday morning anytime? He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. Because he had no clue about it. It was only only me and Fat knew about it. <laughs> Wanted to like surprise him, like we're all just chilling, having lunch, and then like Zach walks in the door and like you know, surprises everybody. <laughs> so he changed my ticket and I leave Seattle um, uh, right. and go into Sacramento. Right. And I get to Sacramento. I'm sitting there chilling, like waiting, like probably like an hour before I'm about to get on the plane and go, to, uh, go down to Pasadena and where the flight times are at. And it says my flight is canceled. I'm mm. like, what? So I pull up the flight itinerary on my phone and it, doesn't say anything. Like it still says, like I'm on time to leave here in an hour. Right. And then, like it was like a six. I looked around and like six other people's phones started going off, and everybody was getting an alert like that their flight was canceled. Damn. So everyone runs up to the lady and is like trying to get like tickets rearranged and like get money refunded and all this crap. And I'm just like, like I just start sweating because I get so <laughs> nervous. Like I, I told all the guys about it, and they're all like, "Oh man, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You can't make it. You got to make it." He's like, "You got to make it." And then I like DB or maybe Corrado that looked up different flights, and they found another flight in San Jose. Right. That left from San Jose to Pasadena, and it was leaving in like forty-five minutes. They're like. DB's like, I don't care, whatever. He's like, I- I'm just gonna get the ticket now. Just like, just find a way to get over there. Right. So I hit up an Uber and this guy, uh, this like older guy, hella cool guy, uh, picked me up in the Uber and I told him what was going on. I was like, I was like, I got to get to like Pasadena by this time. Like my flight, like you don't understand how important it is. I get there this time. And this dude's like hauling ass. He's doing like 85 down the highway. <laughs> like he knew like all these shortcuts, like to get to the airport and everything. <laughs> so I get to the airport, I get to check out and like, I get there in time. I'm like, okay, cool. So I go up to the counter and I'm about to do my ticket. And the lady's like, Oh, I hate to tell you, but, uh, this flight actually got delayed. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Damn. I was like, I just hauled ass from Sacramento to San Jose and my freaking flight got, that flight got canceled. So I told the guys about it. They're, they're, they're just like, yeah, there's, there's nothing else we can do. Like there's no more flights going out. Right. So my next flight was at, I think it was at like two or three in the afternoon or something like that. Like I would have got to Pasadena at like four. Right. And I'm sitting there at this bar, like having a couple like drinks of whiskey because I'm like pissed off out of my mind trying to drink my depression away that I just missed <laughs> lunch with Zach. And the lady sitting next to me, um, I heard her talking to someone else about like her flight got canceled and I heard her say my flight number. I was like, wait. I was like, what flight number did you just say? <laughs> and she was like, um, and she said mine. And she said that flight got canceled. Oh my so the flight God. I was supposed to get on at 3 o'clock or 2 or 3 or whatever got canceled again. I had to oh. wait another hour. Wow. So I ended up not getting into Pasadena till after like the movie was over. Like Once I got to Pasadena and I walked into the place where they were having the movie, like literally as like, soon as I opened the door, the credits rolled. Wow. Like the movie was over. <laughs> I was so pissed off, man. I was so pissed off. And then the people at the art school, apparently you're not allowed to bring bags in there. Right. So like I came straight from the airport. Like, so I had my bag with me and the lady's like, Ooh, yeah, you're not allowed to have bags in there. But she actually ended up being hella cool. She was like, all right. It's like, I understand like your flight got delayed, you know, three times. Like you've had a crappy day or whatever. So she ended up giving it to like one of the security guys and they held my bag for me. Dope. Like super cool lady, super Dope. cool lady, but Dope. so the next day, um, like I'm watching everybody walk around in these stone quarry shirts that they all just got from Zach at lunch, right? which was <laughs> pissing me off. I was like, Oh yeah, it must be nice. Um, and 
so Mick hits up Zach and is like, hey, um, you know, uh, I know you know David was supposed to be with us at the lunch. He couldn't make it because he had like three missed flights. And like, if you can, if you have an extra shirt, like, can you bring it tomorrow and like possibly give it to him then, like, either before or after the movie? And Zach was like, yeah, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And I thought Zach was either going to like wait till after BVS, after they showed the movie and give it to me, or he's going to like, like give it to Mick and have Mick give it to me or have like his secretary give it to me or something. Right, right. So I'm sitting there like right before the movie starts and I'm like looking on my phone and I hear everybody like stand up and start clapping. I look up and I see Zach like down at the bottom of the entrance where the movie theater is. And he's like, he's like, where's Dave? Where's Dave? <laughs> And everybody's pointing to me like, he's right here. And he walks up to me, hands me a thing, shakes my hand. And like, dude, I had so much adrenaline running through my veins yeah. at that point. Like my hands were shaking. I, I could have ran a mile in like two minutes at that point. Like I was so pumped up. And like, I was just so shocked. Like he took the time to do that right before the movie started. Right. Like he didn't have to do that in front of everybody, you know, like he could have. He could have gave it to somebody and somebody could have gave it to me after, like, you know, when no one saw. But the fact that he, like, took the time to do that in front of everybody and, like, made sure to do that before the movie started was just, like... That was dope. Dude, that was just, like, I, like, I couldn't believe he did that. And then I talked to him after, uh, after the thing when he was, like, you know, taking pictures and signing with everybody. He was, like, he saw me with the shirt and he's, like, oh, it fits. He's like, good, good, good. I was like, yeah. I was like, dude, I can't thank you enough for doing that. Like, I had a crappy ass day Saturday, like, and like that completely made up for it. He's like, oh yeah. He's just like, um, I forget who was talking to him, but he said, yeah. He was like, no, 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 wait. So I'm gonna get this shirt to Dave. You know, it's like I told him, it's like first things first. I gotta take care of my boy. That was dope, dude. It was just like it was incredible, man. It was yeah. incredible. I remember every time I, I watch a video on it, like I still get goosebumps. When yeah, I, watch no, video on I it. know. When I saw that video, I remember I was like, "Wait, that's Dave from Vero." And then I'm right. looking and I'm like, "Wait, why is Zach just walking up to him?" Just and then I'm just watching, like, "Damn, Dave must be cool as fuck." How did he get that? <laughs> you know? you know? Zach, Zach's a cool one, man. Zach yeah. is a cool one. Man. Shout out to so, Zach. I mean, the man. fact that he did that. Yeah, definitely shout out to Zach. And then I, um. Like so, I talk to Fab a lot. I talk to Abdul a lot too, and they always mm. telling me about you. Like, yeah, man, you need to talk to Dave and you know get Dave on and blah blah <laughs> blah. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna get him. But it, it just seemed like there's always something going on with this podcast. There's always somebody that you know wants to come on or or something. Yeah, and I always, no yeah, I always forget about it, dog. I I, I want to apologize, but you know, and oh, then. Yeah. Yeah. Abdul hits me up again and was like, "Yo, did you talk to Dave?" And I'm like, "Oh shit, yeah, you're right. I'm gonna, right. Go, I'm gonna go hit him up. My bad, my bad." No, yeah, I'm glad we finally got to talk about it. Hell yeah, hell yeah. So that shit sounds crazy, man. I'm glad you uh, told me about it. I know we're on a time crunch now, but you know mm -hmm. we can make this quick. But before we let you yeah, go, tell me what should we be doing right now? You know, I know we got to stay cryptic and we got to kind of. You know, right. let everybody know in a matter of fact sort of way. So tell us what coming down from the top of the hill. What should the Spartans, the Parademons, everybody? What should we be doing right now? Uh, I think everything we're doing right now is like we're doing exactly what we need to be doing. I think Friday and Saturday, like we absolutely killed it. Right. Like over eighty thousand tweets with like no planning. Like we just. Like everybody just woke up and just went crazy yeah. on the timeline. Like, like that's perfect, perfect. Right. right. Um, I think this one hour a day thing is genius. Right. Like I think, I think Mick said we did like thirty thousand tweets today. Yeah. And like in that one hour span, so yeah. I think everything we're doing, like, just keep like spamming that hashtag, you know, when we can, like get the numbers up on that real good. I think it's, uh, I think things are going. Going very good right now. Perfect. The way we're doing it, so. Perfect, perfect. One last question: Is there gonna be like a SnyderCon two, or is he planning on doing that again? I, I sure hope so. Right. I sure hope so, man. Because right. I, it was so much fun, <laughs> like yeah. doing that. Like, watch in a room with a bunch of watching BBS with like, 
400 other people who are like just as hyped as you right to right. watch it like there's nothing like that right. i hope he does it again it'd be dope to do it with like 300 right man of steel and right right i don't know maybe justice league that'd be dope <laughs> that'd be dope that'd be dope as fuck i might when i go i might cancel my flights myself so i can be the guy that gets the shirt next time right <laughs> <laughs> Just walk up this like, like, hey man, you don't want to miss my flight too. Let me, I know you got an extra shirt. I know, something. right? Dave told me to do this. Right. All right, man. Well, I'm gonna let you go, man. I appreciate this interview. I'm a pro- yes, sir. I can, it, man. I can probably have this out tonight. It's gonna be short and sweet, so I just plug it on to something else that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, dope, dope, dope. All right, man. Well, uh, like I said, I appreciate the interview, dog. If you ever need anything or you want something shouted out, let me know, man. All right, bet, man. Let me know. All right, yeah. dog. Hit up, uh, hit up Fortnite, man. We'll get some games in, man. Nah, you will fuck me up, <laughs> dog. I suck. <laughs> but I will. Yo, yo, yo. I am back. I hope y'all like that little quick interview with uh, my dog. But check this out. We are going now into a video because we... Me and a few people, Jeff Purdy, Andy Escobar, and a few other people, we were talking about um, how we thought Batman The Dark Knight Rises was kind of like pre-9-11, and um, what Zack Snyder was doing is post-9-11 America. We started getting into that a little bit with... um, uh, Jeff Purdy on his interview, but we can keep it going a little bit right now. But I got this, it's about this Watchmen movie that wasn't made. Um, I think it got, it started in pre production, never got off the ground. But if you look at it and you watch this video, you're gonna notice a lot of similarities to the conversation of pre 9 11 America, Dark Knight Rises trilogy to post 9-11 America the Zack Snyder, what Zack Snyder was doing with, uh, especially in BBS, he showed a lot of it in BBS but this is good because it's like a, a Watchmen video which ties a lot into Zack Snyder but we're still like I said, the focus is on pre-9-11 America and post-9-11 America and look at what was done here and I think it probably still gave Zack Snyder a few ideas of what to talk about mainly in BBS. But like I said, it is what it is. Check this video out. Tell me what you think. Yeah bitch. In 2004, Paul Greengrass was hired to make a Watchmen movie. Ultimately the film was never made and the project would fall apart. But I'd like to talk about what Greengrass had planned. But before we get into all that Let's go back to the very beginning. To some degree, if you're talking about superheroes, um, it's very likely to become a meditation upon power. The first ever mention of Watchmen was when they were previewed in a 1985 issue of DC Spotlight. When writer Alan Moore asked, what if a superhero appeared in the 1960s with atomic powers? What would happen to the world? Then Watchmen issue 1 went on sale in September of 1986, the first of 12 chapters, introducing the world to Night Owl, Silk Spectre, Rorschach, Ozymandias, the comedian, and Dr. Manhattan. It took place in an alternate history where the presence of American superheroes had changed the world. America had won the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon was still president into his fourth term, and as the nuclear arms race threatened to spiral out of control, society was braced in anticipation of a global war that would probably wipe out the human race. The only thing standing in the way of a showdown was Dr. Manhattan. He was once John Osterman, but after a lab accident, he was a hero with godlike abilities, and this tilted the balance of power strongly in America's favour. Watchmen completely deconstructed superheroes as a concept, from both the 1930s supergroup The Minutemen, through to the crime busters of the 1960s, exploring the personal lives of superheroes and examining the psychological profiles of people that would dress up in costumes and fight crime and crucially, the real world effect this would have on a society. Here's the artist Dave Gibbon. I mean, Alan and I both kind of came of age sort of in the 
late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, there was a time of great ferment, a time of huge cultural change. And also in the 80s, there was a very real sense that one day everything might just pass away in a nuclear war. So it was really a, really a scary time. Uh, and I mean, that very much, if you're going to talk about the real world, you know, what would superheroes really be like? What would the real world really be like? You really had to address those kind of issues as well. So after enjoying the country's love and support for years, superheroes would suffer from a backlash against vigilantism. In 1977, an emergency bill is enforced, outlawing all costumed adventuring, and heroes are retired or they're forced into hiding. After the assassination of Crown Buster Edward Blake, aka the comedian, Rorschach believed there was a conspiracy and that someone was targeting heroes. He investigates, sparking a chain of events that may potentially change the world forever. There were three key elements to the novel. It was a murder mystery, it was a commentary on political power, and it also deconstructed, satirised and critiqued the very nature of superheroes and comic books. You find that, yes, superheroes in the real world are kind of funny. They're also kind of scary. Uh, because, actually, a person dressing in a mask and going around beating up criminals is, is a vigilante psychopath. Watchmen was reprinted in her back with all 12 chapters together, and it went on to receive the Hugo Award for Special Achievement and the Eisner Award for Best Finite Series. The comic will be recognised as great art, and it's gone down in history as a landmark masterpiece, selling millions of copies to a worldwide fan base. The film rights to Watchmen were bought by Lawrence Gordon in August of 1986, before the fourth issue of the comic was even out on sale. He teamed up with producer Joel Silver to work on the film with 20th Century Fox. Alan Moore was asked to write the script, but he politely declined, so Batman screenwriter Sam Hamm was hired, and the first draft was completed in September 1988. Arnold Schwarzenegger was due to be cast as Dr Manhattan, everybody was excited, and then in 1991 Fox lost interest and the project moved to Warner Brothers, with Terry Gilliam hired to direct. This made sense because Gilliam's class, 12 Monkeys, Freer and Loving, Brazil, The Fisher King, the man knows what he's doing, and so this seemed like a good idea. But Gilliam didn't like what Sam Hamm had done with the script, and so he hired his own writers, Charles McKeon and Warren Scarron. They redrafted the existing script, and they put a lot more of the source material back into the film we included in Varshak's journal as a narrative device. Warner projected a $25 million budget on the production. Gilliam asked for more. He was refused, and so Gilliam walked. He famously claimed the story was unfilmable, and that the various layers of plot were impossible to squeeze down into a standard movie screenplay, and Gilliam suggested it be a TV miniseries instead. It was very frustrating because trying to condense the watch of it into two and a half hours, is an impossibility, basically, and so in many ways the fact that Joel wasn't able to get the financing for it was a kind of relief. Joel Silver was unable to raise any further funding, and so Watchmen disappeared off the radar again. Joel Silver did an interview years later, and he told her Gilliam's original ending would have had Ozymandias convince Dr Manhattan to go back in time and stop himself from being created. He went back and prevented himself from being turned into Dr. Manhattan, and in the vortex that was created after that occurred, these characters from Watchmen only became characters in a comic book. Personally, I think that would have been a good idea in another story. H.G. Wells did that in The Man Who Could Work Miracles, and that story was written in 1898. So as a plot device, it's really only one notch above. It was all a dream. So the script gathered dust until 2001 because by then, Blade and X-Men had made a ton of money and gotten good reviews and proved there was a market for superhero movies after all. So, the project was resurrected over at Universal Pictures, producer Lawrence Gordon teamed up with Lloyd Levin and X-Men screenwriter David Ata was offered a seven-figure sum to write and direct. Universal hoped to have began filming in spring of 2002 but Hater was still working on what would be a 328-page first draft deep into the summer, and so that didn't happen. Development lasted another two years at Universal, before familiar disagreements ensued and everybody went their separate ways. Watchmen was back on the shelf. So next, in October 2003, the producers tried setting up Watchmen at Revolution Studios. Revolution had just co-produced Hellboy with Lawrence Garden Productions and Dark Horse Entertainment, and Hellboy had been considered a success by everybody. The producers intended to shoot the film in Prague, and some test footage was shot using Hater's script. I'm just going to show you a few minutes of what was shot, and you can see what Revolution Studios had in mind.
Rorschach's Journal, October 12th, 1148. Investigated a murder tonight. Routine homicide by the name of Edward Blake. Routine, but for the mask I found hidden in Blake's closet. Blake was once the comedian. A masked hero like the rest of us. What does it mean? Perhaps I need perspective. I <laughs> think I'll take a visit with an old friend. Hello, Daniel. I helped myself to some beans. I hope you don't mind. No. No, of course not. Want me to heat some up for you? No need. Well, how you been keeping? Out of prison. So far. Take a look at this. This little stain. Is that bean juice? <gasps> That's right. Human bean juice. The badge belonged to the comedian. Blood, too. He's dead. What? The comedian? First you heard about it. Well, I haven't kept in touch with anyone since I retired. Listen, it was probably just a burglary. Maybe the killer didn't know Blake was the comedian. An ordinary burglar? Kill the comedian? That's ridiculous. Yeah, I guess it doesn't seem too likely. What were you doing there? My Thursday night patrol. Still? I heard Blake had been working for the government since they passed the Keen Act. Maybe it was a political killing. Maybe. Or maybe someone's killing off former masked heroes. Don't think that's a little... um... paranoid. Is that what they're saying about me now? That I'm paranoid? I can feel our old enemies out there, gathering. Poor Shaq. All the old enemies are dead. Old ghosts, then. Anyway, just thought I'd let you know. In case someone is killing former man. Thanks. Ah. Uh. At least not everything's retired. Yeah, right. The tunnel's still open. Let's out in the warehouse on Fleet. I remember. Used to come here a lot. Back when we were partners. Yeah. Yeah, those were great times, Rorschach. Great times. Whatever happened to them?
But ultimately, Revolution Studios dropped out, and The Watchmen then made its way over to Paramount Studios, with Darren Aronofsky set to shoot. Darren Aronofsky lasted a full week before he moved on to make The Fountain and the film, yet again, found itself with no director. After the studio briefly flirted with the idea of a Tim Burton, Johnny Depp as the comedian version, Paul Greengrass was offered the director's job, and now, the film finally had a target release date of summer 2006. A website teaser went live, and Paul Greengrass was ready to knock it out of the park. He said, I agree, it is the greatest graphic novel ever written. It was political, it was dark, conspiratorial, and with something to really say about the world, as well as being a fantastic comic book rad. Greengrass began pre-production, with a cast rumoured to be Paddy Constantine as Rorschach, Jude Law as Ozymandias, Hilary Swank would have been Silk Spectre, Ron Perlman as the comedian, and Jacqueline Phoenix as Nartile. A Dr. Manhattan special effects test was commissioned to see if it could be done in camera with practical effects, and it seemed as if the script had finally found a director who relished the challenge of adapting the comic, a director who was a fan, and a director who had a clear vision of how to adapt the material to his own vision. Paul Greengrass had previously made his name in Britain on the ITV documentary show World in Action, and then in 1987 he co-authored the memoir Spycatcher. The book focused on revelations from Peter Wright, the former assistant director of MI5, and the government called for the book to be banned from sale because it was alleged to be revealing secrets. In referencing the case years later, preparing for Watchmen, Greengrass said, It was really an expose of what was going on. At the time that that book came out, there was kind of a fantastic 12 month period where it was a court case and it became a great set piece encounter, trying to define where the boundaries lay between the government's desire to protect national security and our rights as citizens. Greengrass went on to make Bloody Sunday in 2002. The film showed the conflict in Northern Ireland through the 1972 killing of protesters by British forces. Bloody Sunday won a ton of awards, including a Sundance Film Festival award which attracted him a quarter from Hollywood and this gave him the opportunity to be direct the spy thriller, The Bourne Supremacy. Based on Robert Ludlum's novel, the Bourne series had updated the setting from the Cold War to the present, and this was the idea Greengrass would run with on David Hayter's next draft. This would be a New York after 9-11, when America's weaponized and regulated super being Dr. Manhattan decides to leave the Earth. Enemy states from Western Asia and the Middle East begin a series of offensive moves that would lead to a global nuclear war. Heavy loss of life and catastrophic destruction. That's the scene on the streets of New York after the United States suffers what's being described as the worst attack on the country since Pearl Harbor. Federal buildings are evacuated. Government leaders taken to secure hideouts. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible. The character of the comedian would still be a government agent who worked undercover in foreign countries to, to destabilise them, but where the graphic novel states that Edward Blake was born in 1924, this script has him born in 1944, so instead of the 1985 date used in the comics, the updated version took place in a 2004 time frame. The comic book comedian had fought in World War II, Korea and Vietnam, but this new version would place him as a young soldier at the back end of the Vietnam War and then onto service in the Gulf War, followed by tours in Iraq and the Middle East. The United States conflict with Russia is changed to one with Afghanistan. All references to communists are replaced with Middle Eastern terrorists, and the feeling was that the updated script would work based on the feeling we live more in Dr. Manhattan's era now than we did in 1986, and this Watchmen film would try to explore the modern paranoias without losing any of the other story elements. I did set it in a contemporary setting. Um, you know, I brought forward a lot of the um, a lot of the modern uh, incidents like 9/11, things mm. like that, uh, the Iraq War. Uh, tried to tried to bring the politics up to date for the 2010s. I, I mean, you know, the themes were not. Um, you know, they were still, unfortunately, very relevant to mm. to uh, to today. So, um, yeah, it took a bit of gymnastics, but uh, but I did update it to present day. Uh, and then that was one of the things that Zack uh, Snyder decided to go back to the 80s. Um, having been a kid in the 80s, the, the, the threat of nuclear war was so huge and oppressive. And we had kind of forgotten that in, in the early 2000s. We, we forgot that in the 80s, we all walked around 
expecting nuclear bombs to fall on us within half an hour and mm. and that'd be that um so i thought there was value in kind of reminding people that all those nuclear bombs are still out there and and uh and the threat is still very real dr manhattan was a key character to greengrass how would arian's plan be executed upon a world that doesn't necessarily want to be united in peace would a plan even work like that or would it just divide society even wider apart Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. On Tuesday night, I gave the order for British forces to take part in military action in Iraq. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land and sea. Their mission? to remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. They began building sets at Palmwood Studios in London and a crew was assembled. Production designer Dominic Watkins and art director Peter Venom. The visual effects supervisor Stephen Begg, whose work had included Batman Begins and Tomb Raider, he was hired, and Kim Barrett, who would later work on The Matrix, began designing costumes. The website Comic Boot Resources did a brilliant interview with Dominic Watkins, who said they were working on a film that would have felt more like Batman Begins. He said there was a greater deviation from the specifics of the novel and less of a reliance on obsessively replicating dialogue from the book, maintaining the book's spirits, themes, ideas and goals without necessarily being a direct page to screen panel for panel recreation. And he also released some of the concept art he'd worked on. And in his interview, he said, Watchmen was written under the backdrop of Reaganism and all that in America, and the Cold War being in full effect. I thought that the political climate from Bush had escalated to a similar point, with us on the brink of something quite catastrophic. So I thought making a version of Watchmen that was contemporary and applying it to the decade of the 2000s was a really good idea. It would have been done a little bit documentary style and a little bit of news reporting mixed in. I feel like that would have been really interesting to see as it would have felt as real as possible. Hell, I want, I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said wanted, dead or alive. That could have been a very interesting take on the story, and I can't help but be curious to see what this movie would have been like. The plans for this movie included a fucked up version of the L-ship that was in really bad shape, and buildings created by Dr. Manhattan that looked very much like living atoms. It would have been much more of a documentary style film following the exploits of the Minutemen in wake of the murder of the comedian. According to Dominic Watkins, he and Greengrass were about one week away from actual production, and Paramount had spent at least two or three million on development. Six weeks into production, Paul Greengrass conducted an interview from London with Chud.com, revealing his early ideas for the direction Watchmen was to go in, and to reveal some sources of inspiration and influence for the film. In this updated setting, Greengrass believed in many ways that a lot of what Watchmen is about has become more relevant yet again saying, One of the things that distinguishes Watchmen is that it's about the way we live today. At that time, it was about the way we lived then. I think we need to make a film of Watchmen that reflects the times we live in. We are once again in very paranoid times, in a way that we haven't been before. I'm talking about the post 9-11 world. We have been in levels of paranoia that we last experienced at the time of Watchmen. That's what drives us. We fear Al-Qaeda. We fear terrorists, but I think underneath there is a much deeper fear. How do we keep peace in a world where these technologies are spreading? That's what I think we have to use Watchmen to address. I think that's really important. The threat to Britain today is not that of my father's generation. War between the big powers is unlikely. Europe is at peace. The Cold War already a memory. But this new world faces a new threat of disorder and chaos, born either of brutal states like Iraq, armed with weapons of mass destruction, or of extreme terrorist groups. Both hate our way of life, our freedom, our democracy. The central dynamic at the heart of this adaptation of Watchmen would have been the tension between Dr. Manhattan and Adrian. It was very important to Greengrass that on this production, the settings of the world be realistic, that it would be the world we recognize and understand the New York of 2004, rather than it being a romanticised Tim Burton Gotham City. Greengrass said, An alternate history is a brilliant conceit. It was not the world we lived in, but it was the world we might have lived in. And it was this very idea that we would have been determined to get across in this film. How would people respond to an actual government-sanctioned Superman? 
The film would have been fascinating in its examination of regular people turning crambuster and its real world consequence. The documentary Superheroes, directed by Michael Burnett, shows every reality doesn't always live up to the comic book page. In response, a member of the Extreme Justice League, there is such a thing, has arrived in costume to help police track down the groper and fight crime. He has this message for the man who's been on the prowl since last September, striking fear in the community. You can run, but you can't hide. And all I can say is, um, you know, our scene is your fear, evildoers beware. In Extreme Justice, this is not the NFL, this is the XJL. Real life superheroes, aren't necessarily any crazier than you or I or anyone else. They take the stance of if superheroes were real, what would it be like? Real life superhero. They are dedicated to what they do and they are also doing good at the same time. When the average citizen attempts to take the law into their own hands, they're doing it for maybe noble reasons, but because they're impassioned by something and perhaps that they're not using the most clear judgment or the most common sense. And anytime anyone acts without common sense or without good judgment, good things rarely happen. I told you my bombs aren't, aren't no funny business. I'll be out here till about two, about two. Yeah. Okay, you still carrying the taser, right? Yeah, I have a taser okay, and I have just, a stun gun. Just, just to let you know, man, just don't go anywhere on campus, on dude, campus, with that, okay. because if you go on campus with the, with the stun gun, it's bad news. You okay, know what I'm yeah, saying? Understand. The police officer's uniform gives people confidence that a trained professional is here. Someone that they recognize is someone to help them is here. Unfortunately, a lot of people see a, a real-life superhero costume, and they think of it as just that, a costume. Paul Greengrass also said in interviews, what's really important is that when you sit inside that world of our ensemble of Cape Crusaders, that you understand that these are human characters, flawed characters, that they're not superheroes, or that only one of them technically really is, Dr. Manhattan. It's that concept that you have to have a human drama that involves this cast of characters and that you understand where they come from, that this is not just some casual thing that they do, they do it because they're compelled. We do not do this thing because it is permitted. We do it because we have to. We do it because we are compelled. With the catalyst of this new Watchmen being the terrorism in New York and the subsequent war in the Middle East, Greengrass was also very eager to explore the ideas of political lies and misinformation to engineer society's compliance and bias to any given agenda. The liberation of Iraq is a crucial advance in the campaign against terror. We've removed an ally of Al-Qaeda. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Any country on the face of the earth with an active intelligence program knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. The choice is his, and if he does not disarm, the United States of America will lead a coalition and disarm him in the name of peace. We, we, we've had no evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved with the September the 11th. We're dealing with terrorists who operate by highly sophisticated methods and technologies, some of which were not even available when our existing laws were written. The bill before me takes account of the new realities and dangers posed by modern terrorists. Less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. United States military forces captured Saddam Hussein alive. Where are Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction? Former Chief Weapons Inspector David Kaye said last week, quote, we were all wrong about Saddam's WMD. By now the world knows there was a massive intelligence failure in the war on Iraq. President Bush and other countries... The failure to find Saddam Hussein's alleged weapons of mass destruction has raised serious questions about the legitimacy and legality of the ongoing war in Iraq. 
Later. Later, on the set of Green Zone, and Greengrass would say, It was such a waste of life. We had a war, and many of us were not happy about it. And in particular, there were these great crises of whether or not we had been told the truth. What you had injected into the culture was this vast amount of lies and deceit that swirled about and made us all doubt what we were being told. It was like, can we trust them? Are they telling us the truth? Are they telling us the truth about really big important things like why we went to war? Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. May God bless our country and all who defend her. Other than the legitimacy of politicians, one of his more unusual influences on how he would approach Watchmen was the Milosh Forman adaptation of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Greengrass said. There's something about the crime fighters in Watchmen, in an odd way, that reminds me of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, both the novel and the film. You're looking at a world that is of our world, even yet it is very separate. In regards to the cast of actors lined up, Greengrass said, If we cast this film right, with the right actors as I believe we will, we will be able to convey as those characters in Cuckoo's Nest conveyed so magnificent, a world within a world. You are entering a private society that exists in our own society. It speaks to us, and yet its mores and its wardrobe and its behaviour is totally different. But there is, within its differentness, its separateness, a type of heroism, a quality of compassion, a degree of humanity. Greengrass also looked closely at the work of photographer Diane Arbus to evoke that same sense of feeling alone together. Her most famous subjects were outsiders such as transgender people, strippers, carnival performers, nudists, dwarves, and other marginalised people who had to carve out their own identity against a backdrop of conformity, Greengrass said. Diane Arbus work is a very interesting way of understanding it too. If you look at the Arbus photographs of Circus Folk or whatever, it's the same as Cuckoo's Nest, a secret off-kilter world functioning within our own. I think that therein lies where we need to go with Watchmen as a piece of drama. The director's favourite moments were the two Mars sequences, the one where Dr Manhattan is by himself and the one where he's with Laura. He said, Those scenes, the powerful and profound discourses, the human drama and the emotions underpinning all the other layers that the novel would explore are absolutely where we need to be with this film or everything will fall apart. Syria says one of its military air bases has been attacked. Russia has once again warned the United States not to take military North Korea's action. nuclear and missile capability has posed the toughest foreign policy dilemma. Was Paul Greengrass' third key influence in pre-production. First released in 1984 by the BBC, after a nuclear attack destroys a NATO base 20 miles from Sheffield, the town falls into chaos. A young married and pregnant couple are separated as the fallout spreads. Paul Greengrass urged his crew and production team to watch this show as a means of understanding the human drama surrounding such a potential catastrophe and the footsteps to Armageddon. Greengrass said, Fred's was one of those unique events that you can only have in a country like Britain on television, where everybody tunes in to watch the same thing at the same time. It was responding absolutely head on to the same sort of paranoia that begat Watchmen and Alan Moore. I remember it as one of those seminal audience moments in my life of watching something where I was horrified, compelled. I couldn't lift my eyes from the screen. I was watching something that was speaking to me about what was happening in the world. It was actually a very beautiful screenplay about a young couple in Sheffield moving into the first apartment together, and it was full of youthful hope. It was set against this gathering international crisis that nobody took any notice of until these individual dramas got blown apart by this terrible cataclysm. Greengrass wanted to film Watchmen using the docudrama format in several scenes. The camera technique that is now seen as Greengrass' signature style is very fluid, very kinetic, very raw and very rough, a method he developed as a documentarian in England, handheld and usually following the action. Yet this rapidly edited shaky cam was rarely seen in Hollywood until the Bond Supremacy. We would have seen the events of Watchmen relayed via news footage and newspapers and other supporting media, told in the same way that Alan Moore presents it in Watchmen, the intent being for the viewer to not just observe the movie, but to experience it. The project looked all set for green light as pre-production moved towards a shooting date, and then the curse struck again. On the 6th of June 2005, it was announced that Brad Gray, the boss of Paramount Studios, would be replacing Donald Dillon with Gail Berman in the position of studio president. 
Paramount Studios, once described as the place where dreams go to die, first wanted to cut the Watchmen budget by 20 million, but then ultimately Gail Berman decided the project wasn't her cup of tea and the film would eventually move to Warner Brothers. Greengrass left for production, set construction at Paramount Studios was cancelled, and speculation suggested Zack Schneider was interested in becoming involved, and the rest is now history. There's no way to know how Paul Greengrass' vision would have ultimately played out to Watchmen fans. Some insisted the comic never be filmed at all, some wanted it on the condition it was a shot-for-shot, word-for-word, big-screen recreation of the novel, and other people felt, so long as there was a respect for Watchmen's spirit and soul, that a filmmaker should be allowed to adapt and do their own thing. But to leave the last word to artist Dave Gibbons, when Warner's finally released the Schneider-directed movie, he was asked if he was happy that the script didn't update the story to include the coalition war on terror, to which he answered, Yeah, I think that's the absolute key to it, because it makes it a classic. It sets it in an historical time frame, and we can compare what's happening nowadays without it trying to be what's happening at the moment. There's always a terrible thing with films that deal with pop culture, that if it deals with the pop culture of today, it gets really old really quickly, and I don't think that will ever happen with Watchmen. So there you go, that's the Watchmen film that never was. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you.